Hey, welcome back to Bodj Vlogski. This is a vlog about the Monster Sculpture Project. I'm also using... <laughs> I've got a selfie ring light. I'm going to have to do a video where I show you this thing. There's a store in uh, Eindhoven called Flying Tiger. I remember reading about it being like this sort of... It's a knick and knack shop, but it's like really nicely designed knick and knacks. Um, I remember reading like something about it being innovative for some reason. Because knick and knacks are usually crap, I guess. I mean, these are still cheap and probably made in terrible places by people that should be better looked after. I just bought it because it was ridiculous and now I'm using it. Uh, and it's kind of useful. This is not what I was going to talk about this video. So yeah, this uh, episode is going to be about the Monster Sculpture Project merch. Monster is a very cute, uh, adorable town in Germany. I don't. I really am so confused about what's a town and what's a city at the moment. Every ten years since 1973, what year are we in? No, 1977. <laughs> They have a like a sculpture festival. Ten years is a long time in between events, so it's pretty darn special when it does occur. And it's just like sculptures take over the city, the town, the village, whatever you want to call it. They're everywhere. You get a map, and it's almost it's a little bit of gamification because you just like want to follow the map and see all the things. Uh, and like traditional sculpture, but also really non-traditional sculpture, um, which you will see in the highlights I'm going to show you. So here is highlights from the Monster Sculpture Project for 2017. That was probably really unattractive, wasn't it? Okay, the first in my highlights from the Monster Sculpture Project is a massive installation work by an artist called Pierre Huey. The work was called After a Life Ahead. And I think for many people, it was one of the highlights. It was just the scale was pretty amazing. When I went there, there was a woman who actually went to the ice skating rink before it was left derelict. And so she was there to see what happened to the old skate rink, which quite a lot had happened <laughs> for this installation. For a start, there were these sort of massive vents in the ceiling, one that was permanently open and one that would open and close. Uh, and that was letting rainfall into this sort of uh, excavation work, which was then forming these sort of muddy puddles that, or that sort of scummy puddles that looked like they were sort of harboring some sort of life. There, was, there were beehives which were installed, but then, and there were also flies installed, which these particular flies only lasted for a day. So th there were flies sort of around and you're like, are they meant to be here? And then you realize these flies are really not doing well. They're not having a good time. There was also like a glass, a uh, tinted glass box in the middle of the room, which would illuminate depending on the sounds that were coming out of the sort of concrete, the holes in the concrete. The most remarkable thing was though, uh, on the very side of, there was this sort of unassuming sort of black canister thing, some sort of electronic equipment plugged in. And it was just sort of sitting there like, you know, I, I, I sort of noticed it was black, like a lot of the installation pieces were black. So I thought maybe it's part of it. And uh, what you would do is there was an app you would download and on the app, it was like a, a augmented reality thing. And inside the canister were living cancer cells, which were multiplying. This canister was really scary once you knew that. And then if you use the app, sort of um, things you could see that, that would change when the cancer cells were rep replicating. So it all tied it all in together. It, like once you sort of peeled back all the layers of what was going on. It was just kind of mind-blowing actually and definitely a highlight. My second highlight from the sculpture project was a work by an artist called Gregor Schneider. 
Uh, and the works, it had a really long name. I think it's just like a name and address though. The name was M. Schmidt Perfegas 19. Uh, four eight one three Munster Deutschland. So it's like someone's address in Munster, and oh, this was so good, and we had so little time to see it. There were queues for this, and people were waiting for hours and hours and hours to get into this, mostly because it was a very small installation, and only one person could really go through it at a time without sort of spoiling the effect of it. But uh, essentially, this artist really likes sort of recreating spaces uh he likes building stuff and he re he recreated like a typical sort of flat or apartment german flat or apartment inside the top of this gallery right down to every detail like the proportions were the same there were windows but you couldn't see out of them but the like everything was perfect and he sort of walked through and there's a living room and a bedroom and a bathroom and the shower was on and there were mirrors and it was it was like odd enough that this was a really blank white painted apartment but then something that i still can't comprehend happened when he walked through the space i think there were it was that you sort of walked through and there's a television you can see the other living room it, it was so baffling. There was some sort of amazing sort of architectural Morbius loop thing going on. But yeah, that was that was a definite highlight. My third highlight was an installation uh, called Cosmic Generator by Mika Rottenberg. And it took over a, you know, Asian grocery store uh, and sort of she had embellished it. So you walked through and it was like an empty shop, except there were sort of things on shelves, like bags of tinsel and odd sort of, uh, oh, what's that depressed egg character in Japan that everyone loves? There were, there was products with his little face, depressed little face on them, on the walls and stuff like that. So it was probably an empty store and then, uh, items had been, uh, installed into it. But then when you went through, there was a film showing in one of the rooms and it was this really amazing film, uh, that I really want to see again, these sort of market stall food market stall owners in Mexico who had found a way to make this sort of magical tunnel underneath the, the border between America and Mexico and it sort of involved going into this sort of bubbling pot of stew on this lady's little portable stovetop. It was so good. Mostly because it was, I think the thing I loved about it was it was talking about something really current and something that, you know, there's a lot of emotion attached to it and it was doing it in like a really magical way that made you feel like you were thinking about modern politics without that sort of heavy sense of dread you get from everything about what's going on with modern politics, <laughs> like all of Documenta. It was, it was so good. My fourth highlight was a piece by Nicole e Eiserman and it was called Sketch for a Fountain. It was just what it said. It was great. It was just this really weird, random, lopsided, moldy, <laughs> <laughs> and sprouting water out of all sorts of areas, sort of lumpen version of a sculpture around a fountain. It was really good. It was literally like she'd sort of thrown it together with her hands. For me, it was a really simple idea. I got it straight away and it just brought joy. And I thought that was brilliant. Koki Tanaka's work is my fifth uh, highlight from the Sculpture Festival. And this was non-traditional sculpture to the nth degree. Uh, the work was called Provisional Studies Workshop Number 7, How to Live Together and Sharing the Unknown. So, uh, how do I describe this? It consisted of a series of discussions and sort of uh, film works and sort of uh, tasks that were set to this group of people from very diverse backgrounds. In the exhibition, you see these people getting together and performing the tasks and having discussions, and then the sort of evidence of their discussions is littered around the space. So there's a table, there's a round table where they have round table discussions, and you sit at the round table while you watch them discussing 
their backgrounds and uh, what it means to be foreign and not foreign. And each task involved a different type of filming. So at one point, a lot of them are quite, you know, handheld camera in a kitchen or filming static camera, filming people around the table. But then there'll be like two of the participants sitting side by side in a car. And it's like the two shot that you see in films when people are talking in cars, except they're talking about themselves and how they relate to each other. And um, it was it was so good. And it was... Again, it was like so compared to Documenta, it was so much lighter and more accessible than any of the sort of heavy ham ham fisted stuff that was going on there. Uh, it, again, it just sort of there was optimism as well as the discussion of all the things that are going on in the world that might not be as as helpful as they could be. It was great. I really, really enjoyed it. I could have stayed in that uh, exhibit for ages. Number six on my list is a work called Tender Tender by Michael Dean. This is a work that took me by surprise because the initial reading I had was just like, what is this stuff? <laughs> I was like, it looks like trash. And it was sort of trashy, but it was trashy in a really clever way. Uh, Michael Dean had chosen this really grandiose space in the one of the the main gallery in Munster, and it had these sort of balconies around a big void, uh, and the work was in the void, but you could view it from all sorts of levels. Concrete had been poured into plastic bags, and then the plastic bags had been removed. Except not all of them had; some were still had the plastic bags on them, and there was sort of like these things that looked like concrete poured into tubes and then painted. And there were stickers, there was muck, there was dirt, there was just stuff all over these sort of very, actually quite human scale sculptures, considering the height of the space they were in. But yeah, then you looked closely and the bags and the stickers were all printed with actual text. There were bits of uh, books where it looked like just a trashy novel, but if you read it, it said just I love you, just broken up into lots of different ways to make it look like it wasn't just repeating the same thing over and over again. The plastic bags had love you on it. There was tape that said fuck's sake on it. <laughs> and all these all these terms you looked around and suddenly like this was emotional baggage it was raw like deliberately raw and i think the rawness was what was helping tell this sort of story of it wasn't a story it was just like raw human emotion in the form of a heap of bags and trash and stickers sounds terrible i'm talking myself into a hole because i want to make it sound really good it just was okay take my word for it <laughs> some things are easy to explain some things are really hard Okay, number seven on my list, and yet I'm a Jeremy Della fan. Ever since I went to the show at the um, Hayward Gallery, and I was like, oh, this is really good, earnest stuff. It's really refreshing. Uh, th the lack of irony. <laughs> or it's like, there was irony in there, but it was sort of warm and fuzzy irony. I don't know. He's, he set himself an assignment about 10 years ago, because the sculpture project's every 10 years. So he took that duration as the sort of framework for his work. And there's a German and a Dutch thing where if you live in an apartment you can probably get like a bit of land just on the fringe of the city to make a garden out of uh, and people build little houses. Some some of the houses are actually quite big but they generally, well they usually don't have electricity and sort of stuff like that. It looks like a, house, a tiny house in a really big garden it's literally an uh, allotment, but with a really fancy house in it, but not fancy enough to have electricity and all the mod cons. So Jeremy Della asked a number of these um, garden owners uh, if they could just document the seasons and the plantings and stuff uh, for a 10-year period <laughs> up until the sculpture project now. And then these observations were um, bound into books which you, you could then just sit in someone's garden and flick through. And some people were good at documenting, some not so good. One woman, amazingly, tie, managed to tie in what was happening in her garden with sort of all these sort of amazing cultural events in the newspaper, like bombs going off and stuff like that. It was, it was rich and it was dense 
and again it was really optimistic and joyful at the same time at number eight was a piece of work by some artists calling themselves c a m p camp and it was it was kind of hilarious uh it was like on this upper podium near this sort of music hall or something and they'd put all these uh wires crisscrossing across the sort of space above your heads and they connected to switches there was no instructions it was they were just there and if you were smart enough you'd find the switch and you'd press it and see what happened one switch would operate <laughs> <laughs> this uh, projection in the building opposite of a woman opening and closing a blind and holding up these various uh, sometimes humorous sometimes just sort of odd sort of messages that was pretty cool and then there's another switch that seemed to be operating the church bell of the cathedral that you could see poking out the top of the musical next door except if you pressed it enough times it would start sort of doing a weird remix of the bell and then you're like, that's not actually the bell. What the heck's going on? The other switches, they were TV monitors. You'd think you were sort of progressing the whatever was on the TV with the switch, but actually you were controlling the TV opposite. It was, it was funny. It was really funny. And it was really good. It was one of the first things we saw, and it was a really good start to the sculpture project. Number eight on my list of highlights from Winster was... Uh, laboratory Life by an artist called Andreas Bunt or Bunty and it consisted of a series of videos that where Andreas is making all sorts of bizarre sculptures sometimes with his actual human body the interesting thing was though is that the way it manifested in the physical realm was as a series of posters with QR codes on them and an app so you'd get your uh, Laboratory Life app and you would go around and collect the videos in different places uh, and then you could keep them and watch them later. Um, so it's a sort of weird gift giving thing going on. I kind of get a feeling like when something's attached to an app or if there's some sort of weird augmented reality thing going on, it's very gimmicky but for some reason this was fine because of the content of the videos there was like a, this kernel of actual work going on surrounded by this sort of layering of presentation stuff. Woof. We're up to the last one, thank goodness. I think I'm done talking about sculptures for forever now. This was a, just a completely bonkers piece. It was by an artist called I Karawawa. Karawawa. Saying that's so wrong. And it was called, I'm going to get the actual complete title out because it's quite funny. It was called Harsh Citation, Harsh Pastoral, Harsh Monster. And it was in a field sort of far out of the city. So it was, you sort of had to walk. We actually rode quite a distance to see it. Uh, and it was a series of really crudely made LED tapestries. So it would light up at night. Uh, and each one of them also had sort of audio attached to them. And they would play one at a time. So it would just randomly, one would just randomly start playing audio. And there are all these like songs with lyrics about having to go to Documenta and just like really tongue in cheek lyrics and just the faces of people looking at these things, just these dour expressions like, what? I don't understand. Is this, what is this? Yeah, the Munster Sculpture Project's only on until the 1st of October. And then it's all over for another 10 years. The next one's not until 2027, provided that the Earth is still here and we're all still alive and wants to still exist. But yeah, I, it doesn't leave you much time. Yeah, visit the website Sculpture Project and if you're ever around Monster Way, there are, there are permanent sculptures from the various Sculpture Project years that you can see if the Sculpture Project is not on. And that's me done. Thanks for sticking around to the end. Uh, another video soon, I guess. See you. Bye.